you welcome. Um, we are just completely honored to have Bill Coningsburg here with us. He is an amazing author of young adult novels that are all just, just really, really powerful books, I have to say, just from personal experience, I've read them. I'm Carrie, by the way, I'm a teen librarian here at the library. Um, he's also a former sports writer with ESPN.com, and I don't want to spend too much time up here taking your time away from you, but I'm just really, really excited to have him here. So, let's give him a uh, I'm really glad to be here, and, and uh, it's been a treat to be to race, at Racine. I did not know that it got cold, so I had to go to a hemp shop. This is the only place I could find in downtown to buy something. Uh, it is not my look, but it is now my look. People wearing uh, hoodies. Okay. Anyway, uh, as was said, I'm Bill Konigsberg. Uh, I today and what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about mental health a little bit, and it's not a subject that people are used to having these sorts of conversations about. And I feel because I'm partnered with somebody from the Midwest, I'm allowed to say this about the Midwest, but I'm, first of all, I love me some Midwesterners. Uh, but I know that one of the things about being from the Midwest is we don't talk about things. Uh, so tonight we're gonna kind of rip that off a little bit and just say, yeah, we're gonna talk about some real important things. Uh, first of all, I am not a mental health counselor. I am not an expert on this. I am somebody who has struggled with mental health. I am somebody who wrote a book that is well regarded about suicide and depression. Uh, and my hope for this conversation, it's a nice small enough room uh, that I, I hope that there will be an opportunity for some interaction uh, because I think this is something that we just don't talk about. And it's, it's funny because other illnesses, I mean, what happens when, if you're, especially if you're over 40 and you get together with people, what's the first thing you do? Oh, my this, my this hurts a little. <laughs> but if it's the brain, suddenly that's off limits. So let's uh, not allow that to be the case tonight. Um, I grew up in uh, New York City. I was born in 1970, you can do the math. And uh, I didn't know what depression was. It wasn't something that we talked about. And the funny thing is that my mother was a psychologist, and I still didn't know what depression was. All I knew was that life was something where it felt like I was just always treading water and just trying to make sure I didn't sink. That's what life felt like constantly. Nobody ever said to me, life isn't like that. It was just my experience. Uh, but what happened to me was I went to college for my first year in Ohio, and I did have my first real depressive episode. And I don't think I know, we're not, trigger warning, uh, you know, people sometimes say we need to do that. I, I am just somebody who believes we should just talk about everything, and that the important thing when we're talking about mental health is not to make something look sexy and fancy, that we wanna just talk about it all the way through. Um, and by the way, my hope is that you're going to hear something tonight that will be actionable. I know some people here probably struggle with mental health. Some people might have a family uh, member or loved one who does. And, and my hope is that it's something I say will help. I've done these talks probably 20 times. And what I will say is that usually something happens. And that's, like, for me, that's worth it all. Um, I, I was at college my first year. I was feeling very isolated. Uh, one of my situations was that I was gay, and it was a different time, and that wasn't something that people talked about, and I uh, hated that about myself. I, I didn't think that was okay at all. Uh, I got depressed, and the way that I noticed uh, that something was new and wrong, I was in a comedy improv show uh, one night, and uh, I, I, that's what I used to do. I used to like to do those sorts of performances, and there were only three people who showed up. And if you've ever been on stage in front of three people, you know, that's challenging. And I went home, and something wasn't the same as usual. I felt something happening in my chest that I didn't understand. And I got into bed, and I stared at the wall, and I kept staring at the wall for about eight hours. And that was when I thought, oh, this isn't something I've dealt with before. This, this is weird. I don't like this. So I called a friend, I called my friend Bridget, I told her what was going on, she came right over, she sat with me. Within about 24 hours, she had helped me to call home, 
and I was on a plane home to get help. And I needed that help. Uh, I had no idea, I get a little bit, I don't want to say anything that's, that's rude about depression. To me, my brain was broken. That's the way I would put it. I, I, I mean, my brain wasn't working right. And uh, sometimes people say, like, what were you depressed about? Well, maybe I was depressed about the fact that I was gay. Maybe I was depressed about not many people showing up or not having much in my life. I was depressed because I was depressed. And, and that's, that's plenty. That's really plenty. Um, I'm not going to go through my entire life. I'll just tell you that I have had uh, lots of days in my life, especially in my young life, where, where I was quite certain that the world would be just fine if I wasn't in it. Uh, I used to live where I could look up and see the George Washington Bridge. Uh, I was on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I would look, and I'd see that bridge, and it spoke to me. It was like, you know, one day you're going to be here. You, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be scared, but that's exactly what that bridge told me. Like, life is very temporary for you, Bill, because you're not right. Uh, as it turns out, this book, The Bridge, I'm going to jump ahead for a sec, uh, is about, I knew I wanted to write a book about depression and suicide. I knew that I didn't want to write a book that was like the very popular book, 13 Reasons Why, which became a Netflix special. I know the author of that book. I like the author of that book. I think that book isn't right, though. I think that um, there's something about that book that makes suicide a form of revenge, which kind of makes it sexy. I am not a fan of that. Uh, I think when we talk about what suicide is, we need to talk about it. So that's what this book is, and, and, and it goes like this. Two teens, a boy and a girl, meet on top of the George Washington Bridge. They're both there to jump. They interrupt each other. Based on what happens when they're sitting 100 feet apart, both with one leg, leg over the railing, the world splits into four different realities. And the book is basically each of those realities. Uh, the first reality is that the girl jumps and the boy doesn't. And we get to see everything about what happens to the girl's family, how they react, what happens to the boy and his family based on the fact that he doesn't jump. Uh, and we, and that, when that story comes to an end, we go right back to that first moment. And this time, the boy jumps and the girl doesn't. But we know the boy much better now. And it's a tough read. I'll tell you that of my books, The Bridge, uh, it'll, it'll knock you around. I, I'm a funny writer, uh, but I, I'm not afraid to go where the pain is. And uh, so this time, the boy jumps. We, we really spend some time with his father, and it's terrible. It's a terrible experience to have somebody you love and a child uh, die this way. Uh, and we see the girl when she decides not to do that. The third story, they both decide to jump. And um, we flash deep into the future, and we learn about people we haven't even met before who are, whose lives are forever changed because these two people don't exist in the world. And that was the most exciting part of the book in some ways to write because I love that concept of the, of the butterfly effect and about how everything has an impact. Uh, and the fourth part of the book, uh, they both decide not to jump, and that is my favorite part of the book uh, because while it's not, I, it would be silly to say it was a happy story, they're both suffering from depression, they make this, they forge this beautiful connection, and that changes their lives forever. And I am of the belief uh, that the answer to depression is connection. Uh, in my experience, and I'm only one person, but I know, that, and there are a lot of problems here, I'm going I'm to go into a little bit about what it feels like for me when I'm depressed and what I try to do. Sometimes when I'm depressed, my toolbox is not available to me. And that's a very frightening feeling uh, because I've done a lot of work on this. But um, what I do know is that I better connect uh, because that's the case. Anyway, the, the one thing I like to say about all of that is you know, that third story. It's that feeling that many of us have had who have struggled that you know, the world would be just fine without us. Um, I have a more dramatic story than many do, but I know that we're all the same in this way. Everybody matters, and everybody has an impact. And it's the small things that have an impact 
that we don't know where they go. And so that, the nice thing about that book is we can see, oh, had she lived, this person would have had this experience, and that experience is forever gone. So uh, when I put this book out, we had a, a we did something called Stay Another Day, one of the organizations that deals with suicide and depression called To Write Love on Her Arms is the organization. Uh, they, they got in touch with us, we sent them a, a galley of the book, and they said, this is one of the only books that we've read that gets it right. I said, like, I don't know how that happened, but I was really glad for it. Um, so we had a chance to kind of go and talk to some people about this issue, and probably the most ex exciting of those experiences was in Denver, where I sat with 20 teens, um, and I, you know, you can see in the teens' eyes, I'm an adult and I'm scary. Uh, and so I said to them right away, I said, look, I'm a big dork, and I promise you that's the case, and I just want you to forget that I'm an adult, and I want you to feel safe here to say whatever you need to say, and did we talk? It really made a difference, and it made a difference to me, and I know it made a profound difference to them. And so every situation is different, but I want to make sure that we do something here that you remember. So uh, I want to tell you a couple things, and then I want to make sure that we open things up and maybe we dialogue a little bit. But uh, before I say anything about like ways that we can help people who are depressed or we can help ourselves when we're depressed, I have to tell you something that, that has happened in my life in the last three years. I don't mean to be an evangelist for this, but I will tell you that it has changed my life. And my understanding is that for about 70% of people who try this method, uh, 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 who have, let's say, treatment-resistant depression, who still struggle with depression despite um, medicines, uh, they get relief from this. It is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's called TMS. Um, I did not, not know what that was. I was having in 2021 a very bad, my very first depressive episode in quite some time. COVID was part of that. I think for all of us, COVID was a part of a lot. Uh, and the person who, my psychiatrist, the person who has been giving me two antidepressants for years, I wrote him and he suggested that and I felt like I was up to try anything, especially what he said. It's non-invasive, the side effects are almost nothing. I thought, okay, we'll give it a try. Um, I went and I did that six days a week uh, for six weeks, 36 sessions, same time every day. I did it in the morning. I was lucky my very good insurance covered every penny of it, which uh, is unbelievable. Uh, it is not an inexpensive thing, but if you have insurance and you are suffering from depression, I would tell you, look, um, basically it's like you put a little MRI machine on your head, there's a facilitator, and it sort of zaps you in certain places. It's, it's not pleasant, but it's 10 minutes. It's anything, anybody can handle it. We sit there and we talk. If it's a particularly strong zap, my, my jaw would go, not the end of the world. For about the first two weeks, I thought it was gobbledygook, that I was not feeling particularly different. Uh, somewhere around the end of week three, the beginning of week four, I woke up one day, and the world looked just slightly different. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll report this today to my facilitator. And I said to her, you know, I feel a little different. And she, she smiled. She said, yes, usually around four weeks, people, the people who are going to be helped start to feel helped. What it felt like to me, this is just my story, and I know some of the science, but I'm not a science guy, but some of my neurons were not connected to each other. They were not connecting in the right way with the serotonin or whatever. That some of those spots were dead or, or just not working. This apparently wakes them up, and what it felt like to me was that all my life, I had a little ski slope, an icy ski slope in my brain, and my brain, I, I would teeter around the edge of it, and if something went slightly wrong, I'd start to fall. And there was just nothing I could do. And once I was on that fall, all of my knowledge availed me nothing. I, I just couldn't get out of it, and it was so painful. If any of you have suffered from depression, I, I assume you will agree with me that it's painful. Mm -hmm. there, there, it is physically painful. 
So I began to feel that, that, that I was getting another pathway to go around. And that has been my experience. I've actually did, I actually did a follow-up six-week session the year after. And uh, what happens to me now, and I feel so grateful because this is nothing that I did other than get lucky uh, and get a good suggestion. But I feel as though it has given me another option that when I get to that precipice of something that has always taken me down, and look, I'm a sensitive guy. That, that is just true. Uh, a lot of writers are sensitive. A lot of artists are sensitive. Uh, but that's not the same as, as dealing with depression exactly. Um, suddenly, when those things happen, what I would call my toolbox is available. It's like I can look around and say, oh, this is that depressive moment. What should I do? And I tell you, all of the times that I thought in my life, I know that there's something I can do, but why can't I do it? I just couldn't get there. My, my body, my brain could not get to the place where it needed to go to save myself. So I feel extraordinarily grateful from this gift. Uh, and if it's something that you are interested in, I would suggest going online and taking a look. It's, it's legit. Sometimes people do it with uh, ketamine treatment. I did do some ketamine treatment. I cannot speak to you exactly about whether that was a great idea or not. Um, I can tell you I enjoyed it. But, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I think that it was probably a little bit just that I had fun, <laughs> uh, that it felt good for an hour. Uh, maybe they say that something, they can't explain what ketamine does, but it does something to the brain and it works as medicine. I defer to the, gym, to the experts on this. But TMS, I feel strongly about. Okay. Um, I'm going to shut up for a moment and just... I'd like to take the temperature of the room and see what would be useful because we can talk, we can go in any number of directions. I have some other things I want to say and share as thoughts about depression, but are there any, is anybody feeling like they'd like to say something that they'd like to ask a question? Nothing to be afraid of. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, I have bipolar. Mm -hmm. And so I am very familiar with depression. Yeah as well as media. And so I have had this for mm, 22 years. Yeah. And it came up on me when my husband had a heart attack. The shock. The I depression was, part. No, or, no, the whole both. Thing. It was onset was his heart attack. Yes. Okay, got it. And after going from support group to support group, I decided they were a bunch of hooey. I was going to start my own. And so he, he helped me, and it's part of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, which is centered out of Chicago. Okay. It's an international group. Okay. And I got trained as a facilitator, nice. and uh, on and on and on and on. I am here tonight because we have a group, we have four groups that meet every week. There are about 40 of us. Okay. That here we, locally? Um, online. Oh, great. Okay. So we've got people yeah. we've got people from all over. Nice. And um, two people in one group said, I'm having problems with suicidal ideation. Yeah. And I thought, mm, we've got to do something. Yeah. So this was timely oh, for me. And I, so I'm here to pick up any notes, anything I can say that might help them. Thank you for saying that. And, and I'm so glad that you're here because that's the way that this works. We help each other and we don't know where these ideas are going to go, but, but that's the way that information is spread. Um, I do have some suggestions uh, and, and, uh, about suicidal ideation. And I talk about this both from the perspective of the person who's dealing with it but also somebody who wants to help, who feels helpless. Uh, both are very serious uh, challenges. Um, as a person who is caring for somebody who might be dealing with suicidal ideation, the things that I would say, again, I'm not a, an expert, but I have sat in on enough of these conversations, and I've had my own life experience. Uh, number one, listen more than you talk. <laughs> Always a good suggestion. Don't follow what I'm doing tonight, which is talking more than I listen. But uh, this is a special circumstance. 
Uh, very often, the feeling that some of us have when, we, when somebody's struggling who we care about is we want to fix it. Well, this is not really fixable. Um, there, there are things that we can do to help people, uh, but I, when I'm feeling depressed, I don't want people to tell me what to do. They are not in my head, they're not in my life, and they don't know what this feels like. What I want is somebody to listen to me who will say, that sounds hard. That's all you need to do. Uh, listen, listen carefully. Don't pretend to listen. Listen and be there. That's all that we need to do. That's all we can do. Step number one. Um, affirm, tell them that you care. The only thing I would say that you should tell a person who is dealing with suicidal ideation to do is to get help. Um, it is so important. We are not, if there's anybody in this room who is dealing with suicidal ideation, I can listen you, to you for the rest of my life. There's more help needed. So call a professional. There are uh, suicide hotlines. Those people are there for a reason. There are places that people can go when people who are feeling suicidal feel unsafe, and those are good places to go. So that's all I can say as a, as a caregiver or a caretaker. Um, you, 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 what was the thing that Brene Brown said about this? Uh, the difference between sympathy and empathy. Uh, that's, a, that's a big one, right? Uh, sympathy is when you say, oh, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks to be you. Empathy is when you go down into the hole with the person you hold their hand. Um, and that, I can tell you that I am learning in my life how to ask for what I need. When I am upset, my husband, my partner, is a, is a caretaker and wants to, wants to fix it. And I have learned to stop him from talking and say, listen, I just need you to, to, to be here. I got this. <laughs> Please don't try to fix me. Uh, and, and some of that is because it, it bothers me. It actually kind of bothers me when somebody's trying to tell me because it feels like they're saying, he's saying, you're not smart enough to know that, <laughs> how to deal with this. Uh, and I'm plenty smart. I got a lot of problems. Brains are not one of them. Um, well, actually, my brain is one of them. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I mean, he is meaning his best because he is, he's saying, I've seen this for 20 years. Sometimes this works. Sometimes this works. Still, it's a tough area. We try to stay away from telling people what to do. Listen, listen, listen. So that is the thing I can tell you as somebody who might be caring for somebody. If you are struggling, this is going to sound counterintuitive because I'd like to be able to say something like, well, I know how to fix you, but I don't. Uh, there, th that's not, other than my suggestions, uh, TMS is a good suggestion. It works for about 70% of people. Medicines certainly help a lot of people. Um, when I am struggling, and I try to always use I statements because we're all different, so other people who might have depression, anxiety, feelings like this might feel differently than I do, but when I feel it, my toolbox is gone. It's too late, um, and that's a terrible feeling. I had just released in 2020 a book called The Bridge, which I thought would be helpful to people who were struggling. And I'm sitting there in a chair in 2021, and what that experience of being in the chair was like for me, what depression feels like for me, other than the pain in the, in the stomach and my chest, um, that I'd say something like, I'd better get out of this chair and go do something, have lunch. And then about 45 minutes later, I'd still be sitting in the chair. That's depression for me. Um, was I able to get up and read the bridge? I was not. And so I am not saying the bridge is the answer to, to this. The, the bridge is, in fact, probably better for caretakers or for people who are not in the middle of a depressive episode who want to feel seen, because you will feel seen. Um, you know, that book, boy, when I wrote that book, I had to put a lot of things in place because I was delving down and sitting in the chair of my own depressive feelings. And I didn't want to go there, so I had to go, sit in the chair, and when I was done, I used to write in a coffee shop, uh, there was every day somebody I, I was scheduled to call. And I do believe in that. Make a schedule. You, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I'm probably going to do this. No. Uh, if, if our brains don't work quite right, if my brain doesn't work quite right, I need to have it down on a, on a schedule or else I'm probably not going to do it. So. I wish that that was help, more helpful, but, it, but really, I think that's all that can be said, right? I mean, I mean 
Uh, I do like to tell people what I said about, let me put it this way. I can think of 20 times probably in my life as a young person, places I used to sit in my apartment in New York and I would look out the window um, and I had a back bedroom that looked out to a back alley. Uh, and I'd, look, I'd raise the blinds and I'd sit on the radiator and I'd look out into all of these other people's lives. You know, I could see a few people moving around, others had draw, lines drawn. And I'd think about how they all had it together and how I didn't and how I was just a mess. Our brains lie to us when we're feeling depressed. Uh, one of the most powerful things that has been said to me that I have repeated many times since then, there is new, no thought in this world that is brand new. It's, there is no thought in this world that's brand new. Other people who have, str have struggled with the same thoughts. So what's so important is that we talk about these feelings, that we find somebody in our life that we can share with, who will help us, who will listen to us. Um, what I was trying to say before I got away from it was that when I was looking in, out over the alleyway, I'd have thoughts about how, you know, the first thought was I should run away. I should run away to California. We all know that when you're 14 and you run away to California, that ends well. So I'm glad I didn't do that. Uh, but my other thought was I probably don't need to be here anymore. And when I look back at my life now, I mean, I can't even imagine, my 17-year-old self, my 16-year-old self cannot imagine the journey that I have taken. And that's just true. Uh, my journey has been in some ways more bigger than other people's journeys, but it's true for all of us. We can never know what's coming tomorrow. So what I like to tell people is tomorrow is the day the magic happens. I mean, I mean because we don't know. You can't prove that wrong. How can you say that's not right? I, I mean, it could be, could not be. Um, I need to stick around so that I see what happens tomorrow. And that is enough of a place, uh, uh, enough of a barrier that when I'm struggling and I can't access my other tools, that's useful. Okay, I've blabbered a lot. Let's see who else has something that I, I'd like to ask or share. And, and sharing is okay here too. I'd be happy to listen. Anybody? Uh, Feel brave, and, and, and there are anything that is said will be useful, I promise you. Yeah? I would just like to share um, that for those who don't know, the Trevor Project is a project that is targeted specifically at ending or preventing suicide among queer youth and specifically teenagers. And so I went through a lot of the training to become someone who answers the hotline um, and just kind of wanted specifically because you would ask. I think there's some tips that are helpful. Uh, if someone seems to be actively in crisis, the thing that you should directly start with is figure out if they have a plan, which includes means, when, and where. And if it is very soon and very thought out, that's when you consider like calling 911 for someone. Right. If it's further out, that's when you can just kind of be supportive and talk through more immediate things. But that direness was something that I wanted to share. Like, if Thank someone you. is expressing suicidal ideation, the first thing you need to find out is how soon and how much have they thought it through. Like how because, the point. Yeah, because statistics show that if someone has a plan with specific means and a timeline in mind, they are much more likely to attempt suicide and thus die by suicide than someone who just is like, I don't know, I'm just really struggling right now, but I haven't thought of anything specific. That still cause for concern, but it's not as urgent. Um, that um, is huge information. Thank you. Wait, Keep going. I, I'll add, I'm a school psychologist, so I'll go ahead and add one more piece because it seems like it's helpful. People mm -hmm. are turning. So something that was really um, very early on in training that we're taught um, that I think is also helpful just to clarify when you're if you're asking questions like that about do you have access to means do you want to die 
it's important that you're really clear and explicit. Don't use euphemisms, don't beat around it, say like, do you want to die? Do you want to kill yourself? Do you have access to something? You want to make sure that you're being very clear. Um, so that's my other Thank you. Comment. No, that is extremely helpful. And, and by the way, just so I, I have also, I've gone through the Trevor training. I actually did a fundraiser for Trevor in 2015 about this topic. Um, and when that book came out, I, my understanding was we were going to go to schools all over and talk about these issues, and I was so looking forward to it. COVID! Uh, so that never <laughs> happened. But one of the stipulations that I made uh, with uh, to write Love on Her Arms was that I would not do this without a school uh, counselor uh, present. I cannot pretend to be a counselor. It's not a good role. It's dangerous. Uh, all I can do is be a friendly person who can listen. Are there other things that you, you would want to share about, because I, I know there are things about the Trevor Project in particular about stats and how scary this is. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot and I'm not great at memorizing things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, another thing we're talking about research shows like, you are not likely to trigger a suicide attempt by asking someone about that. So if someone is being vague and you need to ask them, that is not going to put the idea in their head if it wasn't already there. So you're not endangering another person by asking them, are you considering suicide? Because that's an idea that a lot of people have. It's like, oh, but I don't want to put that idea out there. And then suddenly they are thinking about it because that's research to show that's just how that works. But um, for queer youth specifically, the statistics they've collected show that having just one supportive adult in a young person's life reduces the risk of them dying by suicide by like 75% if I'm running with I think that was good. Something like that. Something crazy where it's like just having one supportive adult to be affirming and accepting and that again that's a statistic that applies specifically to queer youth but it's an important one to keep in mind and why it's important to vocalize your support not just silently try to be there for people and, and there are ways that you can do that if that is important to you if you want to be an ally and there it's a very powerful thing there are ways that trevor project can help you become that ally and, and of course visibility is important if you're a teacher you can have a sign that says this is a safe space. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. And, and uh, I will tell you that I have a little bit of a Superman complex. It's just one of my character defect, defects. And so I've had a lot of kids in my life tell me by email or at meetings that they're struggling. And the thing that I can't do is my first impacted, which is I will help you. I will save you. Stop it. Bill, you're not that person. So, so I have to first slow down, and what I really have to do is ask who their person is. Who, who is your safe person? Is there a person at school? Is there a person at home? Um, are you safe? You know, these are the important questions. Um, the trouble project, uh, just explain it a little bit. Well, yeah, do you, would you please? Sure, yeah, so they are a national, well, somewhat international, but in terms of like, their suicide hotline, text line, chat line. Um, it's just in the US at least currently, and it's specifically geared towards folks aged 13 to 24, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, there is there is no like requirement. Like if someone who is outside of the age range calls the hotline or who doesn't identify as queer calls, like you don't immediately get kicked off the phone <laughs> or kicked out of the chat. Um, they just try to target their resources more towards their intended demographic. But um, they have a 24-7 hotline um, where people can call day or night and talk to a trained crisis intervention person, um, which is why I know all this, because at one point I was going to the training to become that. Uh, didn't get there because life is crazy and you know ADHD and depression also make sitting down and watching tons of videos and learning lots of information and get unsworn challenging. But um, that is that is a resource that exists and it is specifically targeted toward because queer youth are so much more likely to die by suicide than their cisgender heterosexual peers. And 
Um, so they knew that there was a need for a resource specifically for those people. Along those lines, this is not the only thing we're talking about, but I, I do think this is a sort of really important topic, and there may be some of you who are here because you have young people in your life who might be LGBTQ who are struggling. Um, I've watched this happen with one person in my neighborhood. Uh, this young person uh, came to our neighborhood from Illinois, where they, they were 18 and queer, and they, they moved. My friend Tammy, who is uh, they, uh, just a kick-ass woman, uh, who is not queer, but is just incredibly open-hearted and wonderful, took this person in. Uh, four years later, uh, Magnus, who is now transitioned, is now male, uh, calls Tammy mom. Uh, I'm Uncle Bill. Um, it's a powerful thing to do. Don't expect somebody else is going to come in and take the role that you could take. You can do that. I'm not Superman. I, I make it very clear to Magnus that I don't have expertise in here. But I can sit with Magnus in a coffee shop while, when he bitches about life, and I can go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Because I have been there in some ways. Uh, and, and I don't need to give advice. My advice is typically not so great. Um, <laughs> don't do what I did as a teenager, I should say. Anyway, uh, so, so it's just something to think about. You know, if there's somebody in your community and you feel like you're the kind of person who can take on a loving, warm role without crossing lines, please, um, you do that. You do that. Be there. Be an uncle. I call. I, I told Magnus early on, I'm, I'm your weird gay uncle. Uh, and that's stuck. Uh, he's now 22, and, and I'm weird Uncle Bill. Um, what else? What other... Topics, thoughts, questions, concerns, anybody? Yeah. Have you ever um, been admitted to a facility or written about people, you know, that, that get to that point where that they have either they check themselves in or they mandatorily have to go in? Uh, yes, uh, in a way. Uh, it's funny that uh, normally when I talk about this, I, I usually start with this. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so. Uh, bear with me, but uh, I, I did have a situation where I uh, nearly died by suicide. Um, so when I was 27, but I always say it could have been 18, it didn't matter what year it was. It was the accumulation of a lot of terrible feeling about myself. And uh, I was living in Colorado, and I was extremely lonely. Um, and I, I just was going through a terrible depression, and uh, one day I took pills. I took sleeping pills. I had sort of taken them from a friend of mine who had them at their house. I had ordered them, and I took them. And after taking them, I had a moment which saved my life. And that moment was me thinking, not what if I die, because I was in a lot of pain. It was, what if I don't die, and I'm forever maimed? And that scared the ground out of me. So I picked up the phone and I called a friend and I told him what I had done. I passed out while on the phone. I woke up in the hospital. I had had my stomach pumped. I understand afterwards because I now have more of a story, some certain things that bro broke my heart when I heard them because I didn't know this. Um, apparently, uh, the cops had to break down the door. And somewhere along the lines, uh, between that and being in an ambulance, I told them it was Father's Day, and that's why I had done. And it wasn't Father's Day, but that was uh, it, that was good information for me to hear. You know, oh, what's going on there? And I, and I was able to look back and go, oh, okay. I felt really, really sad because of my relationship with my father, and I hadn't dealt with it. Uh, I will happily report to you now that I. At 53, we were extremely close. But we weren't until we were. <laughs> we had to have it out, and I had to be an adult, and I had to say something. Um, and just be an adult is not right. I had to say something. Um, I was admitted to a, a place as you are when you, when you um, uh, attempt to die by suicide. And so I have that experience. What's odd about it is I remember very little of it. I, I don't know why that is. Um, it's, I don't know if I shut that off. Uh, 
if I shut my memory off, but there are certain parts of my life that I don't recall very well, and that's one. Uh, so yeah, I've had that experience, uh, and I never want to have it again, I can tell you that. Um, have you had somebody in your life who's had that experience? Yeah. And I think um, my, why I asked the question is because we were so afraid of that option. And then once it happened, yeah. we realized that it was an important option to have. Yeah. And, um, you know, and we were trying so hard to avoid it. Sure. Right. Because of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you don't know what happened in there. Right? Like, <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I, and, and do you wind up not? Did you wind up going that route where the person went into the, mm -hmm. okay. My understanding is that for many people, it's a life-altering experience. So, I mean, uh, there is no, I started this way, there's just no shame in this. It feels like there's shame in this, but if, if our brain isn't working quite right, our brain isn't working quite right. Um, and, and it shouldn't be any different than our stomach or our kidney, uh, but it is, you know, people have, Ideas about weakness, uh, you know, that this is a weakness, this is a person's fault, all that kind of stuff. We have to put that kind of talk away, it's dangerous. Uh, what, what else? Do, do other people have comments, questions, thoughts, concerns, jokes? I'm okay, kidding, no jokes. Actually, you know, because you're, you're an author, yeah. um, I've read five books or so. I can't be picky, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to. I'm happy to do yeah, that. But, uh, did you study journalism? Uh, so I studied creative writing and English in English, college, which English is what happens English. when you uh, want to be unemployed for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody tell me. <laughs> I had somebody tell me. A college teacher tell me, if you're gonna, uh, don't try to be an author. You can't make money writing books. A, they were right, but B, I was really, I'm really sorry that they said that to me. I mean, I've done perfectly fine. But um, I just looked for a job out of college that would pay me to write. And I loved sports. I could go tell you a 30-minute really interesting story about what I did to get these jobs. I'm not going to do that to anyone. Uh, but uh, I wound up a journalist, and I wound up a sports journalist. Uh, that lifestyle was not great for me. Um, I apparently am somebody who's supposed to be skinny. When you go and you sit at a ballpark for the Associated Press, you tend not to stay skinny. Um, and, and also at a certain point, I, I think I realized that that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. That was just a thing that I had done. I was glad I had done it. I've had fascinating stories. Uh, I just found out before this, I'm, I'm reeling a little bit, that uh, Lily Bean, who is the uh, first really openly gay baseball player passed away at 60 today. I was very oh. sad, he was a friend of mine. Uh, I didn't know he was sick, so I'm obviously not that close a friend, but uh, I was the first openly gay person, at, uh, a gay man at ESPN. That is part of my claim to fame. Um, fame strong, my claim to whatever. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, so, so I did what I had to do to get to make money as a writer. Uh, but at a certain point, and I feel very privileged that I was able to do this because I, I am. I, I came from a family where they would send me to grad school, and that's what I did. I was 31, and I said, you know what? I want to write a book. I really want this. Can you help me? And my mother said, yes, we can help you. So I did go to grad school, and you know, I am not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps guy because that's, uh, that's something that most people can't do. But while I was there, I worked my butt off. I wrote a book. Uh, it got sold right after grad school, and I've been writing since. And um, it's a very hard industry. Um, my husband's a lawyer, and he's always joking, I'm glad I don't have such a tough job as you. <laughs> uh, and so I, I always say, like, don't be a writer like, don't be a writer for a living unless you have to, uh, because you really have to have that desire uh, to put up with the BS that is part of this world. It has just been unreal. I'll write a book someday. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What school were you uh, in Ohio? Uh, so I went to Oberlin for one year. Did not, did not work for me. I wound up at Columbia in New York. Uh, and then I went to grad school at Arizona State, mm -hmm. which was a good choice for me. I, I, was, meant, I was supposed to be born out west. Uh, I like a lot of space. 
Uh, I am not a New Yorker. I, I just people are like, how how did you come from New York? I uh, I could try to talk New York if you want me to. I'll be happy to do that. Come on. <laughs> uh, what else do you have? What, what other questions do we have here? Uh, I, I just know that um, you know high school, middle school for, for queer youth is yeah. hard to navigate. I mean, you touch on that in a lot of your books. Yeah. And like just the bullying that goes along. It just seems like kids are so mean nowadays. <laughs> I don't know if it's getting worse, but. I think it's getting different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think in some, I could make an argument that it was worse then, it's worse now, it doesn't yeah. matter. It, it, it's bad. Yeah. Um, and, and what's bad about it now is that it comes home with young people. Yeah. So that social media makes it that there's no break. Uh, and I don't think, frankly, that I would have been strong enough to handle that. The stuff that I was putting up with at school uh, really took me down. You, you know, kids can be mean. For my, ex in my experience, seventh and eighth grade were the worst. Uh, they were just, uh, the kids were just brutal, um, and I, I, I suffered a lot of bullying. I was about this tall and about 80 pounds less, <laughs> uh, it was a skinny thing, and uh, I was smart, and I had a big nose, and, they, and it was easy picking, and they made fun of me. And, and what's so funny about that is as I've gotten older and I've looked at it, I realized you know, there's that great Brandy Carlisle song, The Joke, which is about, I've seen this movie before and the joke's on them about bullies. She could not be more right. I mean, good grief. The things that I have going for me, that I had going at that time, I didn't know. You know, I, I, I have done well and we have done well. Those of us who go through tough times as a young person often have a chance to come out in really good shape because we learn resilience. I was seeing like on social media that there's even more of a, a tide turning where people say if someone calls you fat or ugly, those are adjectives, and you need to strip the power from those words so that they don't affect you. But so it, it's it's nice to see people saying stuff like that because yeah, people are trying. But then it's like by putting it into practice is a different story, right? <laughs> And also, I mean, to me, the, the thing about words is, it, you know, I'm not one of those words can never hurt me people. I, oh, I'm yeah. also not a complete uh, left-wing person who believes that all words hurt. I, I'm somewhere in the middle, but I, but I do think that words have power, and, and, and they can be very, very painful. Uh, so, A, one thing we can do as human beings is not get into that and not be those people who use words those ways. Uh, B, stand up, be an upstander for people who are being bullied. Uh, C, claim our space when people are bullying us. Um, what we don't do, by the way, and this is just what my mother told me to do when I was 13 uh, and I was being bullied. She said, you should write a petition and bring that to school and, uh, you know, t that, that, that bullying is wrong. Was she tried to take a bully She was trying. Well, like mother. Let's see how it works out for her. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. I mean, I remember that so clearly. Um, yeah, no, uh, and also, um, clinical adolescent psychologists shouldn't become parents. <laughs> That's, a, That's a terrible joke, but there's a little truth to it. She was a, an interesting mother to have had. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, is anybody here a clinical <laughs> psychologist? Uh, we laugh. Uh, so, what what else are there? Are there things that we can? You know, we have plenty of time, and it's it's it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to kind of have these conversations. Yeah. You've written seven books now. Uh, I'm curious what all the topics are, real quick. Sure, sure. You, you said about the bridge. Yeah. What are you feeling is something that you got cooking that you want to do next? What are things that you've done that you feel you'd like to go do or see done, either by yourself or other people? What do you think is needed, kind of things? So, good questions. I'll, uh, let me try to see how to answer. So, in a word, I started to write books in my 30s that were the books I wanted to see when I was a teenager that did not exist. 
1986 and 1987, there were not gay books, especially gay books that dealt with being a teenager. So I wanted to write those books. Um, I wrote a book because I'm a football fan called Out of the Pocket. It was my first novel. It was supposed to be called Audibles. If you're a football fan, you know that that's a really kick-ass title because it means a lot of things. Um, my editor at Penguin said, let's not do that because that will, uh, let's open it up to more than football players, uh, fans who read, which I think was good. good <laughs> um, Out of the Pocket was about a, a, a football player who is secretly gay in California. He's, a big time prospect, he's going to be a college prospect, he tells one friend, the friend sort of betrays his trust, tells other people, it becomes a national story. It's about coming out in the spotlight. Uh, that was my first book. I didn't want to be the guy who just was in a niche writing those sorts of books. Gay and sports had been a lot of my story. I thought I'm putting that behind. I want to write other things. And so typically the stories that I've written have been something that as an adult, I have been working through, and I just move it into a young adult world and make a story out of it. The second book uh, came from a place I was telling the story this morning. Uh, the more generic version of the story is that if you were a gay person and you're sitting on a plane, something that can sometimes happen is that a person next to you wants to say hi, and I love people saying hi. I love to say hi. I really like people, except for when I don't. And <laughs> Uh, the problem, though, is that I wear this ring, uh, and on a plane, or in the case, what, what I was explaining this morning, playing racquetball in Billings, Montana at a gym, somebody saw my ring and said, oh, uh, you're married. And I said, yes. And he said, what's your wife's name? And I kind of had this moment of aggravation. I thought, well, I mean, why, why do I have to go into this? I don't want to deal with this. Uh, and, but I'm not a liar. And then I said, Rachel. And, and you know, went on with the game, and I got in my car afterwards, and I thought, what just happened to me? And what happened to me was that I had a book come to me in the, in the middle of playing uh, racquetball. And it's called Openly Straight. It's my most popular, most famous book. Uh, and I say famous, it's on Hollywood now. Uh, the guy who wrote Sweet Home Alabama has written, wrote the screenplay for the movie. It was in production, it fell apart. Now we're reworking on it as a TV show, a limited series, and I'm writing it with him. Uh, we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. But anyway, uh, that book was really about the fact that nobody tells you when you're a kid that, that coming out isn't a one-time thing, but it's a thing you have to do the rest of your life, and that's unfair. So I wrote a book about that, about a kid who decided, who was openly gay, but decides to go back into the closet to an all-boys boarding school to recreate himself without the label. He's not going to lie. Madness ensues. And, and so that's a book that really hit well. I wound up writing Honestly Then as a sequel to it because people were not happy with the ending of Openly Straight because they thought it was a love story. It's not a love story. That they read it wrong. Um, <laughs> it's a coming of age story. And so I wrote a story from the point of view of the other boy in the book. Uh, otherwise, The Porcupine of Truth in a Word, hard to write to say in a word, but it's about friendship. Uh, a straight white boy and a gay black female uh, be, befriend each other in Billings, Montana, and they go on a road trip uh, that's really supposed to be about finding the mystery of what happened to one of their grandparents, but it's really about finding out about life, about learning how to be a friend, learning a little bit about spirituality and religion, and, and I, it is not a preaching book. It's the opposite of a preaching book. It's a book about two kids who feel that they've been let down by, or, by God and organized religion, and by the end of the book, uh, the last line of the book is the prayer, thank you. Like that's, the, that's the prayer, thank you. Which is to say, it's an agnostic book, it doesn't tell you what to believe, brings up some questions about, you know, well, what's out there? Uh, and that was the thing that was going on for me at that time. Uh, Destination Unknown is really my book going back, it's the most recent of my books, it's going back to 1987 and growing up in New York. I wanted to write about what it was like to come out during the uh, beginning of the AIDS epidemic in the epicenter of it. I do not suggest doing that. If there's another pandemic, <laughs> don't, don't catch it. Uh, it was a challenging way to grow up and so I wanted to write that book. Uh, young people do not love historical fiction. That's what I learned because it's a, it's a pretty darn good book. It got great reviews. It has not been well uh, read. It has not been all over the place.
place. Uh, music of What Happens is the first time I tried to write a romance on purpose. Um, it is a book about toxic masculinity. I was in a men's group at the time, and I was very interested in the messages that men get, all kinds of men get, about who we're supposed to be. And it's perfect for this discussion, because one of the things that men are supposed to do is not have emotions unless they're angry. And that's not attainable. Um, and so uh, we're supposed to suck it up, hold it in, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, and that's, that's not actually the way things work for most people. Most of us need help. So uh, I, I wrote about that in, in the guise of a love story. And I think that's all my books. Uh, so what I'm doing now, though, that what's a little bit different, uh, I have just gone through liberty, uh, literary puberty. Um, I cannot write any more teen books. Uh, the voice has gone away from me. I am 53. When I started this, I was 32. Uh, and the voices were closer. And I, I believe that young people can sniff out BS really, really well. And uh, I do not want to be caught in that place of not knowing what I'm talking about. And you said, it's so different growing up today. I mean, I can't possibly imagine what it's like. So it's in some ways not surprising that my last two books, The Bridge and Destination Unknown, moved away from the kind of contemporary realistic fiction that I had been writing before. I, I no longer felt comfortable with So I'm writing adult fiction. I'm hopeful that uh, I'm on deadline. I have a book due in about two weeks. And I'm hopeful that I'll have a start a new career doing something else. I will always want to help young people. I'm really glad I've done what I could to help young people. Uh, but I also think that it's time for young people to step up and take, take on the mantle and, and let, me, uh, let me amble up into the sunset. sunset. <laughs> Relax a little bit. <laughs> so does that, is that kind of what you're wondering? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. What else? Um, other thoughts, questions, comments? Anything? Curiosities? We don't have to stay. We can always uh, end early if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's becoming less fruitful. There's so much more that we can say, though. Um, about depression, is there anything else that, can, uh, that, that would be useful for us to talk about? Yeah. I mean, I feel like so far you've been the only person in the room who is like openly suicidal. And so I just like, I feel like it would be useful to say like, that's like basically since puberty, like I've been on and off like active and passively suicidal, but never not suicidal. Uh, and one of the most important things for me, uh, cause I always get like to that point again, there will always be another crisis point. Or at least, you know, there doesn't have to be, but it's been reliable. I'm so sorry, first of all, that you've gone through that. That's, it's, it's, not, it's just terrible. What does it feel like for you when you're struggling? What, what's the feeling like? What are the, what are the words in your head when you're going through that? It's like, I don't know, if I have both hands on the wheel, then like one of them is taken off and then the other one I just let go of. It's like when things start to spiral, I, I probably give up on getting myself out of that spiral before it's actually possible, before it becomes impossible for me to pull myself out. You know, uh, yeah. Because I just know that it's coming and I, I expect it so much. Uh, but I have, like, I have successfully pulled myself out of the spiral before, but I do just fall into some destructive patterns. I mean, I know that you know. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, like, there's always some, like, new plan, some new way of doing it that catches my attention. For me, I don't, like, What has pulled you back from the brink when you have decided to? Because I know what mine is. I want to know what yours is. I, I'll tell you mine, but, but what's yours? All right, if you tell me yours, then. Uh, uh, mine is Lila. 
Leela? Leela Alcorn. I don't know what that is. I couldn't hear it. Leela Alcorn, uh, she was 17. Uh, and she was... She's a trans girl who killed herself in 2014. Oh, gosh. Giving her horrifically separate bullying. Yeah. And I came across it because uh, I was uh, what people of my generation would call chronically outlined. And uh, something that she got popularized. Her story got known because she must have been suicide down to Tumblr. She posted her suicide note to Tumblr. Uh, yeah, like uh, basically like Twitter, but near year, I guess. <laughs> so did you come across that? Was that something that was happening in real time, or is it something that you saw after? I like basically right after she did it. Um, a lot of people were just like reposting her suicide note, and so I just came across it raw, basically. Um, and how helped you, you said? You said that's <laughs> not, not at first. <laughs> not at first, right. Uh, but, see that was back in 2014 and she was 17 at the time. And she had parents that didn't accept her. She has the wrong name on her gravestone. And I think about her uh, a lot when I get bad. Because, I mean, for one thing, like everything, about like having a plan, knowing when and where you're going to do it. That is very real. I know I'm tracking these things with myself now because like I've had enough experiences with it. Um, and what was said earlier about like you like you have to be real with people who are suicidal. I think that's very true because like the easiest thing for me to do is to write somebody off because I'm like you don't know like <laughs> you don't know what I'm going through right now. Sure, sure. Like if this is going to shock you and I don't feel like doing that. But Leela's really important to me as a story just because she never, I mean, she never transitioned. She never got to. Right. And I, I almost killed myself yeah. at a time when like, I never would have known what my life could have been. And it's so, like, it is such a dramatic change. And, I mean, especially for that particular experience. Like, I, when I really don't want to bother anymore, like, I feel like I have to do it for her. I love that. I love that you, you created that sort of relationship. Um, and, and we need to have things like that that we put in the way of these very, I mean, this disease wants me dead. I'll speak for myself. It definitely wants me dead. Um, and it, it lies to me. So it tells me that I'm useless, uh, that I'm ugly, that I'm stupid, uh, that I'm foolish, that I embarrass myself all the time. I, I'm sure that I'm seeing some people nod. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's had these sorts of thoughts. What it does is it tells me things that I would never say to my worst enemy, because I'm a nice person. I would never say to somebody, you, you don't need me to say it. Um, and I think that's valuable to look at, right? Like, why is it that, we, what, that I talk to myself in these ways that I wouldn't speak to somebody I disliked terribly? Um, that's one of the stops that I try to use. And, and the other way I put it would be to, do you know the phrase um, emotional intelligence? Is that something you know? Uh, that's something I think about a lot too, um, that I think that one of the things that happens to me when I'm depressed is I, I have a pretty good forgetter, and my forgetter forgets uh, some basic things. And one of them is, I, I like to play name that emotion. I, I mean, I'm not above this game. I, I don't always know what I'm feeling. <laughs> you know, it's just this amalgamation of mush that's going on inside here, and I don't know what it is. So sometimes what I have to do is just sit down and say, what the heck am I feeling? What am I feeling? And very often, um, it's a bunch of things, but the words sad and scared and lonely come up. Right? Um, I know I'm not alone in that. And it is useful for me to know that I'm not alone in that. 
that these are lies that my brain is telling me. In fact, uh, boy, I remember when a, a therapist in my 30s told me to do affirmations, and I thought this was the dumbest thing I ever did. It was not the dumbest thing I ever did. Uh, I, I was supposed to come up with the seven things that I, uh, the worst things I say to myself and then turn them around and make a sentence. I don't remember what that sentence was, but to affirm and look in the mirror every day and say, I am a handsome, successful, uh, kind, smart, you know, all these things. And at first I was saying it and I didn't believe it, but I said it and they said, well, keep saying it. After about 30 days, I believed it. And that's powerful, right? I mean, uh, compare the, the things that we tell ourselves are super powerful. Words and thoughts are powerful. So um, that's something that we can do. And I like to leave a place like that, like this, after something like this, because believe me, I get something out of this too. Your story helps me. Um, and I like to remember some of the ways that I feel now. You know, because it is useful. And, and life never changes completely. You know, life never gets to the point that you're just lying on a beach, drinking a whatever, pina colada, and there are no problems in the world forever. That's not how it works. So I just need to understand, with using emotional intelligence, who I am and what I'm going through. Uh, so that it doesn't, because for me, it gets overwhelming when I can't put words to it anymore. Where, can I ask you, where does the, where do you feel depression in your body when you feel it? Uh, like, I would say, like, I feel it in my shoulders, I feel it in my chest. Yeah. Like, I don't, like, kind of like this upper body, like, it's interesting because, like, depression and anxiety do the same thing to me, which is uh -huh. just get, yeah. I get incredibly tense, like, in my shoulders. And it just all kind of locks up on me, and it, like I pull the muscles in my neck doing that. <laughs> wow, yeah, it's powerful. It's it's a, it's a physical. There's a physical manifestation, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's such a shame because it, it 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 really is all over lies our brains are telling us. I can tell listening to you that you are a kind, worthy person. I can tell from listening to you that you sometimes don't agree with that. I can tell you I have felt both of those things, you know, with, you, you, you know and, and so hear it from me and tell it to yourself, and gosh, I hope that, that you find a way to kind of put a stop to the, the it sounds like a pattern. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I've been there. 53, I've been there. Thank you. What else? Yeah. So if your emotions are telling you lies, yeah. how... Can you be receptive to messages from others that are trying to help you see something more real? Oh, it's so hard. Um, when my brain is lying to me, I'm not open to hearing the truth. Uh, I'm open only to hearing more of the lies because I, it's almost like a compulsion once I start talking negative self-talk. Go, it goes and goes and goes. Um, it's, it's, I think, about putting stops in the way. And I always call that like a toolbox. You know, what can I put in my toolbox so that in a moment when maybe some parts of my toolbox are not available, this one thing is. Um, I have certain people, one, one of the bigger ones for me is simply going into my husband's office and saying, yeah, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. um, th that's all it is. I, I, I've told him, don't fix me. <laughs> but that way there's somebody else in the game with me. He knows what's going on. Uh, and the other, another one is when I feel like I don't want to connect, I'm learning very to, to really counter that impulse, because that's the most dangerous of my impulses. Uh, to isolate, to be alone, to not let anyone in. To me, that's very scary. So. So there's no good answer to that question, but you know, we practice. We practice, we're hearing these things about ourselves. Sometimes I can talk my way out of it, and I can say, ah, that's not true. Um, yeah, yeah, yes? Something that comes with my, like, I don't know, when I get in that way, I guess, like, I get extremely paranoid. And uh, I don't really trust, like, if somebody tries to offer me alternate perspectives, I'll just reject them out of hand because, like, 
I don't know why you're telling me this. I don't know what it you want it to do to me. I don't know what your motive is because I have issues with trust in that way, like especially when I'm emotional. And so it helps me a lot to like have a few things that I just know for sure. Oh, a few things what? Too. That I know for sure, like, I mean, I, I have to know who I am because like, for I, everybody, I think that's a decision. So once you know you made a good decision there, you return to there, you return to your immediate environment, things you can observe in front of you, and then when it comes to people, that's like basic connections that you have to them. You know, like, this is, like, if, if you're coming to me and you're saying, like, I think that you should think about this differently, and I'm feeling too paranoid to trust you, I can, I can at least trust that, like, I know that I like your taste in movies. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know, I, I can just kind of build, like, a, a tentative and kind of slapdash trust in you in this moment so that at least you can bring me down and then we can work things out. I just don't want to forget what's making me upset right now. Um. I understand exactly what you mean by the paranoia. For me, if someone is trying to like interrupt what's going on in my head, my, the paranoia tells me, you only think that about me because I've tricked you in thinking <laughs> that I'm a good person, that I, that I am the things that you're trying to tell me. I've tricked you into that. If you really knew me, you wouldn't believe that. Imposter syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Very, very much. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Something that, because depression tends to be so cyclical, where like, you, once you have an episode, you're more likely to have another major depressive episode at some point in your life, um, is kind of like, laying the groundwork and preparing when I'm feeling more okay. Right. Of That's like right. collecting, like writing down, like this person thinks this about me, or like I know that I like this aspect of myself, or this is objective, because then when I'm not ready to hear it from other people, I can go back and at least hear it from myself mm -hmm. and know like, well, even if I've tricked everyone else, like you can't bullshit the bullshit early. <laughs> this is coming from me. This is legit. Or like also just kind of looking for the patterns of like, okay, if several different people are saying the same thing about me, it has to be true to some extent, even if I don't feel it right now. Right. And like kind of, so honestly, sometimes I feel like a way to cope with depression is like when you're not feeling as depressed to like do the prep work to lift yourself up later. May, may I add to that? Well, I don't prep work with what kind of things would that mean? You say do the prep work when you're not feeling so depressed, so that it's there when you need it. What would that mean? For me, like isolating what things I like about me, being like, you know what, even when I'm unreliable, I don't follow up on the things I say I'm going to do, like I'm always at least entering with the intention of kindness. That is something that is intrinsic about me and that I like about myself and then I can kind of return to that even when I wouldn't instinctively feel that and kind of just those things of like doing the work of like thinking through things to know about yourself when you're not ready. To so you write it down so you reread it to yourself? Or yeah, so write it down. Um, I, know my phone. I, I, would, <laughs> I, know, know. I would like to just yes. add to that because that's so good. To, to answer your question, some of that can be physical stuff. So like, uh, I, I've done the same thing. It's like work on the side, but it's more powerful for me if I have a note in my, uh, on my desk uh, out in the open than if I have a note in my drawer that I have to go look for. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really about seeing the things that I have set up for myself. Uh, I am not a, I'm a quite humble man, and everyone who says they are is, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but, but I am a fairly humble man, but I put my uh, awards and, and things out uh, because there may be a day that I need to see that. I might need that kudo to help me understand that I'm not a piece of trash because my brain will tell me I'm a piece of trash. It loves to tell me that. And conveniently forget all the proof that you're yeah. not. Yeah, right right you. <laughs> so, so like, put it out there. Get that out there. And I loved what you said. I mean, I, I, I'm sad about you saying the thing about feeling paranoid, but I understand it is. It's very hard when we're in that moment 
as you had asked. I mean, how do we get out of that moment? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm 53, I'm still figuring it out. I, I don't know. I just know that there have been some happy coincidences that have kept me going uh, in tough moments. Um, one thing that a person said to me once that can be hard to act on, but it is it will work every time if I do it, is to be of service to somebody else. If I'm struggling, um, you know, I, I'm not a wealthy person, but I'm not a, a person who has no means at all. Uh, I, will, I will go out to a coffee shop and I will get a cup of coffee and I'll give the $20 bill and I'll say the next people who this can cover, please give them coffee, don't tell them where it came from. And it helps because you get to watch out of the corner of your eye somebody be happy. <laughs> and, and it does make me feel good about myself. And, and so it's selfish in that way, but it, it helps somebody else too. Um, there's always a homeless person who could use lunch. Just, you know, just coming up with, you know, that, that could be dangerous, I don't know, I don't want to tell you what to do if it's a bad idea, but there's always somebody who needs something. Um, boy, my, the least favorite thing that happens to me is when somebody online, when I'm struggling, because I live my life very openly, on purpose. I do it as a stopgap so that I'm not alone when I'm feeling isolated, uh, when I'm feeling isolated, when I'm feeling depressed, but also because I've helped people. So I, I tell people what's going on. My biggest pet peeve is when some jerk says, perspective. I want to punch them in the face because that's not understanding the way that my disease works. Um, yeah, I get it. I'm not, <laughs> I, I get on some level I'm not the person who needs the most help uh, and that somebody has it worse for me, but that's not the way, that's not helpful to me. It just makes me feel worse about myself. Um, so uh, another thing, by the way, that I do is I do actually tell people when I'm feeling better. Um, if they've done something that, that I don't like, I tell them how it makes me feel. So, mm -hmm. hey, um, Phil, you wrote perspective and I know you meant to help me, um, but what it really did was it pissed me off because it made me feel that you didn't think I was really struggling. Um, mm -hmm. So if Phil is angry at that, it's Phil's problem. <laughs> I've said my piece. Um, what else? Anything else? We have a few more minutes. I have a you know, course of clarification. Yeah. For lay persons. Um, those words, uh, like he, she, you know, you sometimes uh -huh. you see that and they say, uh -huh. what's your preference? Your pronouns? Like that. Uh -huh. You know. Do you want to hear more about that? It? Yes. I tried well, to look I, it up and it said, but I did find out, by me looking it up, it said that being called the wrong thing is hurtful. That's right. That's exactly right. So for people who are of a different generation, who didn't come up from a time when, when pronouns were happening, my first experience with pronouns was 2015. I was on the tour doing a Trevor Project um, tour of LGBTQ youth places in the South and Midwest. And I was hearing about it and I, I was fascinated. I said, please tell me more, explain to me, help me to understand. And first of all, it's okay to ask, help me to understand, especially if you're coming from a good place. And what you just said is the answer. You know, somebody is having an experience where they don't feel authentically connected to the pronoun that is used, has been used historically to fit them. So they're saying this fits better for me. And so it's just a sign of respect to simply call them what they want to be called, right? You know? And they and uh, the list are the options of choice. Well there are so many. So so, so there's he, he, him, she, 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 her, they, them, but there are also there's a, a Z I E, there's an X I E, there's a lot of things that people use. And, and the answer is always to shake your head and say, yeah, what, what, whatever you need, we're going to do to help you. What I'm trying to find out is in what content? I mean, I have that choice myself. Absolutely, yeah. So if I put he, uh -huh. and, okay, get an email or something, and it says, this person chooses he. Sure. So that's the word you use. That's right. And So I, 
let's say I know a person that is gay. Uh -huh. Or you can always ask. Right, but I'm trying to find out, figure out. You choose it, you know, how do you like to call he here, she, but yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, I've never used that. I've never been in a situation where I had to. It's new to you, right? It's brand new. Right, but so, so does I've been involved in an organization where that, and they use that a lot. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, actually, there's quite a few uh, gay people that is in the organization. Well, so, I, I mean, yes. So, so it's, a, it's a thing that has happened in the last 10 years uh, that has been moved forward by young people. And by the way, young people are always right. You know, they, you know, people always have it right. We think we have it right. When we're older, we don't. So, so as a, a humble person in their 50s, it, I think it's my job to just listen and just kind of like, hey, what's, what's going on? What is that about for you? What do you like to be called? I might ask somebody who I feel close to, tell me more about that. But often I won't. Yeah, you know, because that's just what they want to so, be called. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna make sure this person gets to uh, yeah, no, like, I feel like there's a big misconception, I guess. Like, if, if it's new to you, and if it, like, if it feels unfamiliar, or if it feels difficult, you feel like if you mess it up, then you're gonna get crucified. And, like, I don't, you know, it's, uh, there are people who, who come up to me on the street and ask me, like, what's in my pants, and, like, that's, <laughs> It gets <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it just a little bit forward? <laughs> and so like there, I don't know. It just gets so much worse than getting misgendered casually. So like I don't know. As long as like, as long as your questions are respectful and you're trying your best, like I'm not gonna get mad at you. It's just, you know, it is gonna hurt a little bit if like I get if I get he him. But like. Or somebody calls me bro, like I never really liked that. Uh, but I don't know, you know, like I it, I might not always correct people even because like it's just it's yeah it is. Uh, all day long every day, you know. It happens a lot. Yeah. That means that it happens a lot. Yeah. It happens a lot. yeah. yeah. Those things all stay you know. And it, like, it can you say that you come out, you have to do it the rest of you coming out over and over. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is something that is like, it's so prominent when you're not, when your gender doesn't, your gender identity doesn't conform to the gender that was assigned at birth, and especially if it doesn't correlate with the gender you present as, like, you have to spend the rest of your life coming out. It's not just your immediate circle, it's the kid you went to fifth grade with that you run into at the grocery store who doesn't yeah. know that that's not your name anymore, right. and that that's not how you identify anymore and just like constant and so it definitely becomes a thing where it's like okay yes it's like this tiny paper cut when someone uses the wrong pronoun but do i have the the juice in my battery to correct them and deal with whatever conversation comes after that is it worth is the juice worth this please yeah, yeah. there you go i uh, i have a somewhat ignorant question um i, I <clears throat> Bro, I understand. Yeah. Is dude sufficiently gender neutral these days? I feel like dude has become gender neutral, but I'll stop using it. But for the most part, like I most like I don't know most of the girls I know don't really mind dude. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of thinking. But also like you know just if somebody says like hey I have a problem with that then yeah that's then we don't do it obviously yeah. but it's just a casual dude. Yeah, I'm a little dude. But <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> Um, that was that was guys. Because okay. I had a professor who was very well intentioned who was like, ah, I'm trying to break the habit of saying, hey guys, I'm like, okay, I need to go to Rainbow Alliance and like make sure I'm not speaking for everyone when it's just me. I'm like, okay, hey guys, we can all agree this is gender neutral. Right? We're all like, oh yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, go back to my professor. I'm like, you really don't have to worry about this as much. I grew up in Appalachia, and that's not the South. That's not the North. Appalachia is its own thing. Yeah. But, uh, I would like to say that Appalachia and the parts of the, the, the United States that speak a more southern flavor of English deliver the perfect solution. Yes, they do. The second oh. person oral <laughs> pronoun, <laughs> y'all. Oh, I love you all. Hey guys, all right, y'all. You know, <laughs> it's just like Western y'all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so the one thing.
thing I want to say, and, and to bring it back to your question, what I, what I see and what I hear is a good thing. I think that the change in the world is that people are trying to be kinder to each other. And that's, that's what this is about. And there's always going to be bumps in the road when we're trying to be kinder to each other. So I'm all in favor of us being kinder, you, you know, and, and the bumps are worth it. And, and boy, do I understand when I heard you say about the death by a thousand paper cuts. I, I, I fully relate. Um, you know, sometimes I will have some negative self-talk to myself about overreacting to something. And then I have to be kind to myself and realize, yeah, I'm not really reacting to this one thing. I'm reacting to 80,000 things. <laughs> so it's, it's, it just is. So I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad that you spoke up and you asked. And if there's any more clarification after the session, you can always speak to me. You can speak to somebody else, and that would be useful. Good. Boy, we have a couple minutes. Is there one final question? Um, Yes, yes. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Show my question. Oh. It will be a teddy bear. Oh. oh. For my husband's kid. There's already one, so this is one of the first. Oh. 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 Wow. Wow. offers for any <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, but, um, oh, so there. Oh. I've already <laughs> finished one that is light pink with the like dark pink accents for my one cousin my cousin's older daughter and then her sisters will be this one where it's like okay. inverted, inverted but okay. still pink because they're both very growing girls who love pink so i'm like <laughs> sure we'll give you little princess teddy bears <laughs> so <laughs> sweet okay. yes <laughs> kindness of the yes. world that was yes that's <laughs> lovely <laughs> um i think that we're Done. I, I want to thank everybody for being here and for the wonderful questions and the wonderful conversation. If there's anything that I can help with, uh, my email address will all be, always be available. Uh, if you want to ask me something after, I'm happy to answer. And we have, um, it's like the, unfortunately, I did attempt to procure books to sell, but they did not arrive in time. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a book place that if you'd like to get autographed, then you can apply to a book after the fact. <laughs> nice. So. Uh, yeah. I, I like the bridge. Oh, good. How much that's going to hit me for? <laughs> what, uh, the bridge? I, I don't even know. I know that it's in paperback and it's cheaper in paperback. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, kind of old school. Yeah. <laughs> you like the hardcover? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I wonder. I don't know what it costs these days. I don't know if it's available. Yes, or, right. I'm sure you've got the price. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you got the price in. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, somewhere because uh, it's a, a you know books are my books are available anywhere books are sold. They're online. They're in bookstores. Uh, they're at the library. You know, take this out from the library. Yeah. But I like autographs. I've been getting autographs. Uh, autograph books are great. Yeah, I look. I'm a fan too. Yep. Yeah. So you said you got a book coming in two weeks, and then you said you want a new career. Are you are you Retiring from writing, or are you just taking a break? Or I'm just going to write different? adult novels. I mean, and when I say adult, I just mean not young adult novels. It's time for me to write. I'm actually, it's funny, the book that I'm writing right now is a coming of age at 50 story, which feels really kind of exactly right for the moment. Like, I don't know, us Gen, Gen Xers just never grew up or something. Uh, <laughs> so, so it feels like exactly what I should be writing, and I'm, I'll, I'll always write. I just don't think unless Openly Straight becomes a huge uh, movie or TV hit and I am given millions of dollars to write more books in that series, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's over. Did you approve of the original screenplay? For yeah, I, I, I liked it. I thought it was, it was good. Yeah. There's, it, one, one thing so you learned about, oh sorry. You have a movie. Well, Openly Straight is not it's yet a movie, but it's, a, it's in production as a TV show now. Uh, but it's been in Hollywood for a decade, and these things fall apart constantly. Um, we had Alan Cumming signed on to play the role in, in, in the movie of the guidance counselor, and good boy. Um, yeah, no, 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 so what was I about to say? I was about to say something. I know it's fascinating. <laughs> One important thing for any kind of crisis is resources, you tool about, you know, whether they're your own resources or how you learned mm -hmm. about, and part of that is tonight we all learned a few things from each other, but other resources, 
on the topic uh, in the community, like that the library has available. I mean, that's really important for people to learn about hotlines or whatever it is for any topic. There's lots of topics that need resources. So I don't know if there's other resources that people have. Um, I went to a, a Kenosha Survivors of Suicide meeting it, that met twice a month. Uh, it's been going on for like 14 years, so they take a break in the summer. And I learned a lot about that. I've had two people commit suicide that I know. Um, my 47-year-old uh, sister-in-law and my 24-year-old daughter in December. And so um, I can tell you, you know, go into that. Even if you're struggling with things, go to that because you're still a certain survivor of your own, you know, thoughts. And it, it's really an interesting group. I think they have them all around the country. Sure. Um, and, then they, and then once you go, then you can be tied into their Facebook private page. And the res there's been a lot of resources that I got from that. So and that was the topic for tonight. That's, that's why I came here today. I, I thank you, first of all. And thanks for saying that, because that's really important. There are groups. Um, I wish that I put together a, like a, a, a sheet. I know I, my website has a resources page, BillConingsburg.com resources for just this, uh, but the fact that there simply are groups like that is very, very important. We cannot do this alone. I mean, I haven't had the experience that you've had, but I imagine you've been very much helped by those groups. Yeah, I mean, I've been to church brief, brief share stuff, but it, it was just different to be around a group of people, and almost everybody in there had a late teen, early 20-year-old child that committed suicide. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. I would spend uh, pretty much daily. It's uh, it's okay not to be okay. It's from uh, Hope for the Day. Uh, it's an organization again helping with depression, particularly among young people. I actually keep uh, information about the group just sitting on counters in the team room. I try to be open about. I know, like you say, we don't we don't like to talk about it. But I try to be like more of a open when teens come into that room, just so they know. This is a place where you can talk about it. You can feel perfect. You can feel safe talking to me. You can feel safe talking in here. I I try to be relaxed with a lot of things in that room because teens are teens. I said, you know, once we keep things PG-13, I don't care if you're trash talking to each other when we're playing video games. I, I know I'll swear in the library you have to be quiet. You have to be polite. It's fine. You're teens. But I will shut down any kind of conversation that makes people feel unsafe and that is not, I don't want to hear any homophobic statements, any racist statements, any sexist. That, that is a hard line. In this room, everyone is safe. And I, I will not budge on that. Okay, I have to add one. Mm -hmm. um, um, this library is very lucky that there are a few in Wisconsin. We have a social worker. Mm -hmm. So any kind of issues you feel, um, mental health or even uh, finance, and then if you uh, call us, and uh, we will connect to our social worker, and then she will talk to you. She's a young person, but a very strong person. Ashley's and amazing. Then, <laughs> yes, her name is Ashley. And then if you come in, um, uh, we will give you also a business card. Um, so uh, we are really kind of different uh, aspect of our lives. We are trying to help the community. And that, I think, especially through a uh, pandemic, uh, we are kind of equipped. So if you have any question, just give us a call. Okay. And we will Where is that? And yeah. she will try to connect right okay. agencies yeah. or organizations. What group is that? I didn't hear that, sorry. She's yes. a social worker. Yes, in the library. In the library? In the library. Yes, yeah. in the library. Yeah. On staff? On staff. She is our uh, staff. So, is why we need okay. libraries to stick around. It's mm -hmm. a very important space to, to, to meet just like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.